As you fellas know, Tech and I called this meeting to talk about the new 12-volt electrical system. That sure is a load off my mind. I thought somebody was going to get fired. No, nothing like that, Maury. But Carl and I would like you fellas to get all fired up on learning about this new system. You can say that again, Tech. All of our new cars are on 12 volts right across the board. So it's high time we explain why the change came about, what differences there are in parts of the system, and talk about the care we'll need to take when the system needs attention. Just why did we change to 12 volts, Carl? Well, basically, Wally, the new cars require more electrical capacity. The new system can supply this extra electrical capacity better. New engines, for example, have higher horsepower, higher compression ratios, and higher speeds. The resulting higher combustion chamber pressures make the engine harder to crank and fire. Yeah, you always did say the engine was really a big air pump. Sure, Jim. And the air itself is an insulator. When you pack it in tighter, you need more spark plug voltage to fire the plug. Another reason the new cars need more electrical capacity is because of the greater accessory load more of them are carrying. There's air conditioning, power windows, power seats, and bigger heaters to mention a few. Okay, okay. I can see the need for more capacity, but where's it all gonna come from? Why, right from the usual sources, Maury. The battery and the generator. Besides that, there are design improvements in the spark plugs, distributor, generator regulator, and even the starting motor. It's all been revamped to make the best use of the higher voltage. And speaking of the higher voltage, don't anybody go messing around this 12-volt system with a 6-volt test equipment. You'll burn it up, but good. You're so right, Tech. I sure hope we don't damage any of our testers. Suppose we hit the highlights on those electrical units, Carl. Like that battery, for instance. Good suggestion, Tech. And the 12-volt battery is a good place to start. It's in the same convenient location. But notice that the negative post is grounded. You can see the new battery's got six 2-volt cells. And yet it's about the same size overall as our former battery. What's that one you've got there, the uh, Plymouth Dodge battery? Yeah, Wally. And just as an example, let's compare the 6 and the 12-volt batteries. Instead of 15 plates per cell, for a total of 45 plates, the 12-volt batteries got 9 thinner plates per cell, for a total of 54 plates. The new battery, therefore, has a greater plate area, and that's the key to its greater output. The number of amperes per square inch of plate surface governs its delivery rate and acceptance of charge. By using thinner plates and more of them, both plate area and battery output are increased. The thinner plates are more porous, too. That means less internal resistance because it's easier for the voltage to push amperes into the plates when charging. Right. And since more plate area is exposed to the electrolyte, that also means less internal resistance on delivery of amperes from the battery. Your mentioning amperes, Carl, brings up a question. This 12-volt battery is rated at 50 ampere hours. Our 6-volt battery had a 100 ampere hour rating. How do you explain that? Well, Jim, amperes are important, naturally. But it's really watts that supply power to do electrical work. Watts provide power to run motors, burn lights, work the accessories. When you want more weight lifted, you use a motor that's rated at more watts. When you want more light to see by, you put in bulbs of greater wattage, right? Yeah, that adds up. I still don't see the difference in the car. Look, Jim, here's an example. Let's say an accessory in the 6-volt system draws 5 amps. That means it's rated at 30 watts. 6 volts multiplied by 5 amps equals 30 watts. Now, in the 12-volt system, the rating of a similar accessory can be boosted to 36 watts, while the current draw is cut down to 3 amps. 12 volts multiplied by 3 amps equals 36 watts. So doubling the voltage with the same or even slightly fewer amperes equals greater electrical power. I got you now, Carl. We, we got a boost in power with fewer amps being used in the 12-volt system. You get the idea, Jim. And one big advantage in going to fewer amps is that it increases the life of the contacts in the distributor and generator regulator. Yeah, Tech, and 
Greater point life is important from a service point of view. High currents erode points. As long as you brought up the subject of service, anything new in checking the battery? Not especially, Wally. You should check the level of the electrolyte once a week as before to see that the plates are covered. And when you test specific gravity, use a hydrometer with a thermometer so you can get the correct reading according to the temperature. At 80 degrees Fahrenheit, you should get a reading of at least 1250. If you don't, bring the battery up to full charge of 1275 to 1300 on a slow charger. A quick charge is only a temporary boost and won't build the battery up to a lasting full charge. So slow charge it and you'll do a much better job. So the new battery's pretty good, eh? It sure is, Wally. It has a longer cranking ability and recovers its charge more rapidly under normal driving conditions. Yeah, and quicker recovery means it stays in a higher state of charge whenever it's needed. How about the starter motor? Anything new? Yes, Jim. It's still about the same size, but by using finer wire, the field coils have more turns. This increases the field strength. So when the armature turns, more magnetic lines of force are cut, which results in greater cranking power and endurance. The motor cranks faster and yet takes less electrical energy to do the job. That leaves more voltage available for ignition and quicker starts. I see. There's actually more power in the entire system. That's right, Murray. Another helpful output booster, for instance, is the redesigned ignition coil. In the coil, finer wire is also used. As a result, there are more turns in the secondary windings. More turns plus more volts boosts the ignition coil output. In addition, the coil has a ballast resistor. You'll find this resistor on all V8 engines with the 12-volt system. On the Plymouth and Dodge, fellas, this resistor is mounted on the coil. Tech's right. The Plymouth and Dodge ballast resistor is connected between the negative terminal of the coil and the primary terminal of the distributor. On Imperial, Chrysler, and DeSoto cars, the resistor is mounted on the fender shield next to the horn relay. It's connected between the coil positive terminal and the ignition terminal of the horn relay. The resistor controls the flow of current to prevent distributor point burning at low speeds. It also sees that enough primary current is supplied at high speeds when more plug voltage is necessary. At low speeds, remember, current flows for longer periods of time. This heats the resistor, raising its resistance and reduces current flow through the points. At high speeds, current flows for shorter periods, which lets the resistor cool. That lowers its resistance and increases current flow for maximum spark plug voltage. So that's how the resistor works, huh? Right. So include the resistor in your connections whenever you test the ignition coil. Okay, and I'll be sure to use a 12-volt tester. Fine. Now, if somebody will please turn the record, we'll tell you more about the 12-volt system. I notice that the distributor on this V8 has only a single set of points. Two things make that possible, Maury. First, don't forget the ballast resistor that helps prolong point life. Second, the distributor cam design is changed, so the dwell period is long enough with the increased voltage. So, dual points aren't needed. However, on the New Yorker, Imperial, and Crown Imperial firepower engines, dual points are used. That's because there's a 9 to 1 compression ratio. The longer dwell provided by dual points ensures positive ignition at high speed. When you service the distributor, see that the point gap is 15 to 18 thousandths, depending on the model you're working on. Also, be sure the points line up and are clean. Well, that's pretty much the same. Yeah, Jim, but the rotor used in 12-volt distributors is longer than that used in 6-volt systems. So double-check the part number if you ever replace a rotor. Good tip, Carl. If the 6-volt rotor is used, there'll be a lot of arcing between it and the cap segments. Is it true that the spark plugs are different? They are on all the 8-cylinder cars, Wally. The new design power tip resistor plug has a longer reach. This leads to many advantages. By using a longer porcelain tip, the electrodes are closer to the center of the combustion chamber. This enables the mixture to burn more evenly and completely. 
the greater power from each charge in turn permits a leaner mixture for normal cruising speeds, which provides improved economy. Sounds great. Any other advantages? Well, the longer porcelain projecting farther into the chamber is cooled better at high speed by the incoming air-fuel mixture. This keeps tip temperature lower and helps prevent pre-ignition. On the other hand, the plug is basically a hot type. It has the long tip, which retards heat flow and maintains high tip temperature. In effect, it's hot at low speeds and cold at high speeds. Besides working better over a wider range of operating conditions, it's harder for this plug to become fouled. Right. The longer porcelain means more deposits have to build up before the plug can short out. Use a round wire gauge and gap the plugs at 35 thousandths. And don't bump the electrodes once they're properly gapped. Okay, we'll watch it. Fine, Wally. Now, the 12-volt generator, like the starter motor, also has more turns of finer wire. So with the increased voltage, it turns out plenty of watts to run the accessories and keep the battery charged, even though fewer amps are involved. What's more, fellas, this generator reaches maximum output at a slower car speed. Well, that's certainly an advantage. And sure ought to keep the battery charged. That it does, my boy. And the generator will keep doing a terrific output job, providing the fan belt has the proper tension. I see what you mean, Tech. I'll be sure to check that belt for wear and the right deflection. Say, how about the generator regulator? That's new, too. There's a complete story on the regulator and how to test it in this reference book, Wally. You want to pay particular attention to the new test values, Wally, and study that part about normalizing the temperature of the regulator before each test. Okay, Tech. I'll study that carefully. Now, what else is new? Well, there's a new red signal light to indicate generator operation on Plymouth cars instead of the usual ammeter. When it glows, the generator's not charging. If the light glows when the engine runs above idle speed, check for a loose fan belt, trouble in the regulator, or in the generator itself. You'd check in that order. If the light doesn't glow when ignition's turned on, or when engine speed drops to idle, check for a burned out indicator bulb. Suppose the bulb's okay. In that case, check for a loose connection or a broken wire to the A terminal of the regulator, or the IGN terminal of the ignition switch. That's covering the bases, Tech. Now, here's another point. A red light is also used on Plymouth to indicate engine oil pressure. You'll find the test story on this in the reference book. The new specifications for setting ignition timing are also in the reference book. Remember now, use only a 12-volt timing light on the new system. I don't think you'll have to worry about our getting timing right or using the proper test equipment, Carl. That goes for me too, Carl. I've got to admit I've picked up a lot on this 12-volt system, and I'm glad it's a lot like working on the 6. Fine, Wally. We wanted you fellas to know that most of the 6-volt procedures still apply. Only the figures and values are really different. Now, here's another feature of the new cars I think we ought to cover. Tex tipped me off on an easy way to adjust the power flight push-button control. Hooray, Carl. I thought you'd forget to bring that up. Couldn't forget anything so important, Tech. First, we want to tell all of our owners to push the buttons all the way in. Second, remember that no adjustments are provided in the push button selector panel unit. Why, that button has to be pushed way in to make the proper gear selection, right? Sure, Wally, but an owner sometimes doesn't get the button to travel the full distance. That's right, Tech. Now, if the transmission doesn't shift properly, check the fluid level. If that's okay, you'll have to adjust the control cable. First of all, have somebody in the car push the L button in to the full length of its travel and hold it there. Raise the car on the hoist. Holding the L button in will remove backlash from the cable actuator in the panel control unit. Next, loosen the cap screw on the top of the cable bracket. If there are any washers between the bracket and case, remove and discard them. The cable should bottom in the bracket slot. If it doesn't, rework the bracket 
until it enters the cable groove freely. Install the bracket and screw next, fellas. Put a plain washer and lock washer under the screw to keep the bracket from moving. Yeah, and following that, push the cable all the way into the transmission. Make sure the L button is being held all the way in. Then, gently pull and push the cable into the transmission to determine the free play. Once you know that, position the bracket so it's one half of the total free play and tighten the screw securely. Pull the rubber covering over the end of the housing to prevent oil leakage. Okay, Carl, I got the idea. Fine, but you still need to check the adjustment. So, lower the car to a few inches off the floor. That's safety first to keep the car in place in case your adjustment's off. Now push in the R button slowly. Then turn the ignition key to start position. The engine should not start. Push the N button in slowly, turn the key, and the engine should start. After this, turn off the engine and push the D button in slowly. At the same time, turn the ignition key to start. The engine should not start. Push the N button in slowly, turn the key, and the engine should again start. If the engine starts while the R or D buttons are pushed in, or does not start when the N button is pushed in, you'll have to readjust the cable. However, be sure the neutral switch is making contact with the sector finger. I understand that adjustment now, and thanks. I think I can handle it. Fine. Now you'll find some tips on removing and installing the cable in this reference book. Okay. I'll really read up on that. You do that, Maury. Wally and Jim also. We just got to stay on top of all the service procedures on these new cars. Amen, Carl. Once we're sure that we can service these new features right, we'll enjoy a big payoff in increased owner's satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs>